In a couple of weeks, we will have an opportunity to uh, give uh, Lee and Wanda Smith a great send-off. They are uh, what I consider matriarch, patriarch type couple in this church, and they mean a lot to us. Uh, they've been a, an amazing example for us, and so their last Sunday here will be in two weeks, and I want you to know that we have cards that have been uh, made available in the foyer at the Welcome Center and on the, on the table a couple places. And you can take one of those cards and leave a personal note for them. And a memory album is being put together to give them uh, of those cards from us. So uh, be sure and take an opportunity to do that as you leave this morning. The heart. I want us to think about the heart this morning. Yesterday I'm watching... A uh, college basketball game, and at one point during the game, I'm uh, this uh, one player I'm watching, and he makes a play. I hadn't seen this done before. If I had, I've forgotten it. But his name is Jamani McNeese, and he's uh, he plays center. He's six foot ten. He has a seven foot four wingspan. And on one play uh, on defense, uh, the opposing team goes to make a shot. They put a shot up, and he jumps. And just before that ball reaches its apex, he grabs it. Now, he doesn't block it. He grabs it, not with one hand, but two hands, just grabs it. And if you watch much basketball, uh, it was just an amazing thing to see. The uh, opposing coach after the game made this statement. He said, we don't have anybody like Jamani McNeese. That guy's just grabbing shots, not blocking them, grabbing them with two hands. And what is uh, really interesting about this guy, six foot ten, but when he was in the ninth grade, he was five foot ten. Ninth grade freshman on a high school basketball team, five foot ten. Uh, things aren't always as they appear, and things don't always turn out as they appear. You remember in the Bible, the first king of Israel. Uh, turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. Remember the first king of Israel, King Saul? He looked like a king. I mean, he was a head taller than everyone else. He looked the part. But King Saul uh, did not trust God. And he made a, a grave mistake and probably showed his character to be flawed and not loyal to God. But, so God decided to remove King Saul, the second king of Israel. When the second king was to be anointed, Samuel the prophet was going to anoint him. And God said, Samuel, it's one of Jesse's sons. And so uh, Samuel's going. He doesn't know which one. It's one of Jesse's sons. He has eight sons. The first one, the oldest one comes out. Samuel thinks that's got to be him. I mean, he just looks the part. But it wasn't him. And this is where God makes this statement. God said, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. David was the youngest. David, they, put, they brought out seven sons. None of them. That's not, God said, it's not them. The, David, the eighth son, hadn't even been brought out, but he was the one that God chose. Remember, uh, in Acts 13, you will remember that Scripture says, David, son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do my will. That's what God said about David. A man after his heart. Psalm 24, verse 3 says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of His salvation. In the ancient times, uh, writers and what you read about the heart in Scripture, oftentimes they considered the heart or they would reference the heart as being uh, a combination of a person, what we would call a person's heart and mind. Uh, they refer to the heart as being that inmost part of you. What you are deep down. How you are deep down to the core. That part of you. Uh, and in a pure sense it would be, thing, we would term it uh, pure heart or deep convictions or, or love for what is good. And to contrast that with, uh, with one that's not good would be, we would say, a hard heart or a calloused heart or a jealous heart or maybe a bitter heart. But it's what's on the inside that matters, isn't it? 
the heart of a man. Um, I want us to think about three things that that we need uh, to be reminded of about the inner part of us. And the first one is to see the beauty of the heart. We live in a world that's very much uh, obsessed about outward appearance, right? But our God reminds us of the inward beauty of a person. 1 Peter 3, 1 says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some who do not obey the word, uh, some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct. This is a reminder to us. It's a reminder that we need. That God's design for marriage. Is that the husband would lead in, in the marriage. God's design for family. Is that the, the man would lead the family. Uh, that the men would lead the church. And we try to follow that design that God's given us. Uh, although we live in a world that does it. Uh, we live in a world that doesn't understand this. But wives, you bless your husbands and you honor your God when you support and are subject to His leading. And that doesn't sound right, does it? I mean, I hear our uh, in our today's culture and in our society a statement like that uh, to be subject to your husbands. Folks, that doesn't sound right. Now, you can take a marker and you can mark it out of your Bible if you want. But God is wise and God is right. Now, remember, Ephesians 5 teaches us what that looks like. Uh, husbands, our job is to lead, but our job is to lead by love, by service. Love your wives like Christ loved the church. It's not our job is not to domineer, but our job is to lead. But we do that. Uh, in the way Christ did, by serving and putting our wife first, uh, putting our family first, that's how we do that. There was a, a time recently when Stephanie and I were talking about something, a uh, decision that was to be made, and I, I, I kind of knew what I wanted to do, but uh, we were talking about what to do about this, and it would require uh, an expense, and she said, she said two things. She said, um, have you prayed about it? And then she said, I trust you. You're the leader of our family. I trust your decision. Wives, when you do that, you don't understand how much you bless your husband. And at the same time, in a strange kind of way, as husbands, all of a sudden being the leader, it, it, hey, it's not all it's cracked up to be. There's responsibility there, right? Um, and that's what God puts on us. But my point here is that God talks about the beauty of a wife and what she can do to influence her husband. And this is one that she can win a husband who doesn't believe in the word of God. She can do it without a word. She does it with the beauty of her conduct. Verse 3, do not let your adorning be external. And what Scripture is teaching us here is it's not that... Um, it's not that our outward appearance is of no value. It is of earthly value. It does have some value. Uh, scripture talks about God has given women hair. It's a part of what makes them beautiful. It's a part of their beauty. Always has been. Right? Um, but the point here is the braid. He says, don't let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair, putting on a gold jewelry, clothing you wear. It's not, it's not don't ever do that. But that's not really makes you, what makes you so beautiful. Right? That's not what makes the women of the church so beautiful. But verse 4, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight very precious. If a woman has a gentle and quiet spirit, she is a, a God-fearing woman. Uh, there won't be awards in our society given to that woman. Right? They won't make movies about that woman. They'll make movies about Wonder Woman, right? Who is beautiful on the outside, good heart, but, you know, I mean, she can fight in battle, uh, has the strength of ten men, right? So Hollywood doesn't make a movie about a woman that, notice what, what Scripture says on the end here, 
in God's sight is very precious. Because man, we look at things different. We look at the out, outward appearance. But God reminds us how much of our inner beauty, uh, this is what really makes a person beautiful. We need to care more about the health of our heart than the health of our body. We need to care more about the beauty of our heart than our outward appearance. Young people, seek out a person. Seek out a person with a godly heart. Okay? Young men, we need to have a, a we need to be young men after God's own heart. But young men, seek a young lady that has a heart for God. And when you find that, you will have something. You will have found someone. Uh, that's what God teaches us. Our world says if you're strong and capable and successful, you're great. But our God says if you're loving, if you're serving, and get this word, if you're humble, humility is a word that honors our God. We need to see the beauty of the heart. Number two, we need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our hearts. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Uh, the NIV 84 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And there are reasons for that. Remember this verse in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It, it's out of our heart. Our heart reflects who we are. Right? And there's a scripture, uh, Matthew 15, 19. Out of the heart come evil thoughts. And then, and then Jesus lists these. Murder, adultery, <coughs> sexual morality, on and on. Sometimes we do things and we think, well, I, I, I didn't mean to do that. I wish I hadn't done that. That's really not me. But we need to consider that may have come out of my heart. That, that may be a little more me than I realize. I may need to work on my heart. A little more. There's a great passage in Jeremiah 17 uh, about the heart. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7. And it starts out and it says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. And is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. This is the, it's the picture of a person who, when storms come into their life, they're, they're steady. They're rock solid. They don't waver. Right? Their faith is in God. Their anchor is in God. And, and they continue the course because they're like a tree that has roots that, that is able to reach water. Verse 9. Then here's a statement that's, that's kind of wild and may come out of left field. Verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. And why, why would he say that there? Contrast that. Verse 9. Contrast with verse 7. Verse 7 says trust in the Lord. Verse 9 essentially says don't trust your heart. The heart is deceitful. You've heard the statement, follow your heart. You know, you've heard the advice given, which is, honey, whatever you want to do, I just want you to be happy. You just, whatever you want to do, whatever makes you happy, uh, follow your heart, whatever your heart wants. And the Bible reminds us, our heart, which is the inmost part of us, is still a part of us. And we're a deceitful bunch of boogers. I mean, we will lie to ourselves, right? Right? Haven't you ever done wrong and justified it? You say, well, I didn't mean it like that. Well, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really saying that. Well, I, I didn't, you, you, you misunderstood me. Well, I mean, you, you, everyone else is doing stuff. I mean, you did this and that and the other. <coughs> Lying to ourselves. Stephanie and I were driving here a while back. Every day when she uh, goes to her treatment, she gets on I-44. And if you come from Prattville... Uh, right where you exit on to I-44, there's construction and you now have a, instead of being the place where you need to get it and get into traffic, now you stop, right? So when I did that the first day, you come to a stop and you're trying to merge, but you have to merge from a stop. It's kind of tricky. First time I come to a stop there, I'm watching traffic and there comes a little break in the traffic, but it didn't look like enough to me. Uh, at the moment, I made a split decision and my decision was... To wait. To be safe, right? There was a semi coming. However, there was 
plenty of time I could have gone. And Stephanie said, why, why don't you go? Why, don't, why aren't you going? Why, you could still go, but I had already decided to stop. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm going to wait. And, and, you had, and I, anyway, it seemed like an hour passed. And finally that semi goes. And, you know, then I finally merge on. But she, she's continuing to ask me, man, you could, you know, we're, we're, in, the, we're in the 300 here with the Hemi V8. You could, why didn't you go? I mean, you got this car. This is the fast one. And I argued with her. Listen, I'm trying to be safe. I, there wasn't as much room. The, the semi slowed down. I mean, I went on and on. I laid out all kind of things. Just being defensive. Uh-oh, I know. I know. Just being defensive. And then she said, why are you so cranky? <laughs> And I defended that too. I said, I'm not cranky. <laughs> By God's grace and mercy. I think she was in the restroom when I told that whole story. <laughs> but I've made my confessions and I won't do it again. The heart. You can't trust your heart. You can't trust it. It's deceitful. It's desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So why do we need to guard our heart? Because your heart, your heart's on your side, but in a bad way. You know what I mean? I mean, our heart always has our back, even when, it, even when we don't need it to. It, we can't trust it. Jeremiah 18, 12. This is, uh, God was calling His people. This is just uh, later in Jeremiah. But He's calling His people to repent. Here's what the people say. That is vain. We will follow our own plans. And we every, we, and will everyone act according to the stubbornness of His evil heart. You ever see a politician get caught in something? And sometimes you can tell they're doing what we call doubling down. Just digging in. And you know good and well, it doesn't look, that doesn't look right. Kind of looks like, you know, you messed up here. No, we're going to be stubborn about it. You have the capacity to have a stubborn heart. Amen? Yeah. Let's see if we can get that amen up a little bit. If you're married, your spouse has the capacity to have a stubborn heart. <laughs> amen? That's right. Yep. Romans 2... Verse 4, do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God is a patient God. God's a patient God. But His patience is is to help us toward repentance. Isn't it? God's patience isn't to allow us to continue sinning. God is not patient so that we can just, you know, like a parent with a child that, that probably needs a good whooping, and I know, you know, be careful where you whoop your kids anymore. Anyway, I'm not talking about abusing them. I'm talking about a good awakening on the backside that God gave us for more than sitting. Amen. But with a child, we say, there, there, little Johnny. It's okay. It's okay, little Johnny. This is the hundredth time you, you've uh, spoken disrespectful to me, your father or mother, but they're there. That's not God's patience. Does that make sense? And that's what this verse is saying. Don't misunderstand God's patience. He's wanting your heart to repent. Psalm 139, 23. Here's one. It, it, if I just shared one verse today, it might have been this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there, if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's our, that's our prayer. That's what we need to pray. That's what we need to go before God and say, God, open it up. It's open. Search it. Search it. Like a search on your computer to find a virus. God, search my heart. If there's a virus in there, quarantine it. Kill it. Remove it. 
soften it. Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his way pure? So I want to share a couple ways that we can keep our heart pure. One is to store up God's Word in it. The more we read this, the more we get it in here. The more you get this in your mind and heart, this is how you keep your heart pure. We have to have the Word of God in it. In this day and time, not only do you have one of these that you can read in not only English, but in English we can understand, right? You have it on your phone everywhere you go. You can have it read to you. We have no excuse, do we? To not read, to not get the Word of God in us? We have no excuse. I mean, we have every possible convenience we could have. We need it in us. And, and the second thing is to trust God. Trust God with your heart. Sometimes we want to go our way and do things our way. We need God's way. God, your way's better. I have my way, but your way's better. Yeah. Driving to school the other day, I'll try to make this quick. At uh, Abbey School, you're supposed to go. There's a one one direction that you're supposed to go, and you kind of pull into a little drop-off zone. That's how you drop your kid off. That's how you're supposed to. Well, from my house, I come the opposite way. So I, I can't do that without making an illegal U-turn, which I decided I really don't want to pay an illegal U-turn in a school zone. Fine. And so I've stopped doing that. But anyway, I pull in the parking lot, kind of go the long way. Well, the other day, there's a car in front of me that stops going they're they're going the wrong way to drop a kid off okay they should be coming the other way and in the in the zone but they're they're going the direction i'm going and they just stop in the street stop and then out opens the passenger door and out comes little johnny little johnny gets out and he's meandering around not in any big hurry at all may have just woken up you know well, he got something else he needs to get out of the car. Anyway, there's a part of me that wants to really get angry. Part of me that wants to do all kinds of things. Drive around them, honk, yell, wave. I mean, there are all kinds of things I want to do. And then there's a voice that says, let it go. You know, I... And I'm not saying that I'm hearing God speak to me audibly. I'm saying I'm hearing God speak to me and say, Hey, love is patient. Love is kind. Smile. Just sit there. Let it go. And luckily that day I did. I went God's way. It didn't seem like the right way, but I went God's way. And God's always right. He's always right. I mean, t five seconds later, it was out of my mind. I didn't think about it anymore. But you know, some of you, that, you know, you use your own examples for what your life is like. But for some of you, you understand if you give vent to that anger, it can ruin half your day. Because not only will that be a problem, then every other knucklehead that does anything, it, everything's blown out of proportion from then on. It, it just snowballs. All right, let me finish with one final quick point. Use your heart. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift, use it. Out of, I've talked about kind of the heart, you can't trust it, you know, almost making the heart to be a bad, bad thing, but the inmost part of you has the capacity. It's also where our good actions come from, because out of your heart come great things that we do, right? Uh, Etta May coordinated a great brunch yesterday. That is, that is out of a desire to bless our widows, to bless our members. It's out of a desire to bless. And we're in the season where we traditionally give gifts. We do that out of our heart, don't we? Out of love. We do other things out of love. And so I remind you, you're good at something. And from that gift... Bless people. Let your heart drive you to good works and good deeds and good things. Right? Not only this time of year, but we want to keep doing it. Uh, we're going to close with the song, The Greatest Commands. And uh, it's just a reminder of our, our heart. We need to keep it right. We need to keep it pure with God. And we need it to be the source of what motivates us to love one another. So if you're here this morning and there's something you need that we could help you with, uh, we'd love to help someone become a Christian this morning. Be right with God. If there's something on your heart that we could pray to God about, uh, please come while we stand and sing. Oh,